Well, thank you, thank you all for coming uh, to the White House and particularly for this particular uh, conversation and event on impact investing and kind of building an impact economy. And I think we've talked, of, I've talked to many of you, we've talked uh, to each other, and I think having this conversation here is an important time uh, to really think about how policy can also play a role in all of the work that you have already been doing and where policy could help enhance and catalyze the sector a bit more. Uh, First, I want to also uh, welcome all of the viewers on the White House live web stream. We will be live uh, for the opening session and the closing session. As you break out into your panels, uh, those will not be live streamed, but everything else will be live streamed. Um, this morning, we're going to have a series of speakers in the morning, an opening panel. So we'll have uh, senior White House, White House officials uh, just giving, in, giving intros, welcoming you, but also giving an importance to why it, why it matters within uh, the various parts of the White House. This, this topic is an important part of it. Uh, we'll talk about the state of impact investing. We'll have a, um, a panel, uh, opening panel that will talk about that. We'll have a keynote by SBA Administrator Karen Mills. Um, we'll have our breakouts, and then we'll have a closing session. Uh, just a couple of logistics for those that are looking for bathrooms. Uh, go in the same way you came, go out the same way you came in and take a left. Uh, the men's bathroom will be first. You have to take, turn the corner and the women's bathroom will be um, at the end of the next hallway. So uh, just, just the basic of logistics. Um, and then uh, let me just say it's great to see so many of you making the time to come for this conversation, and we really appreciate everything that you're doing. Uh, more importantly, I think uh, you'll hear from our, you know, you'll hear from our bosses about how important this topic is and why it's important. So I'd like to take the time to introduce my boss, Melody Barnes, who's the uh, head of the Domestic Policy Council, and who has been not only a champion of the issues, uh, but has given us all of the support in continuing to push for doing more within the administration. So let me introduce Melody Barnes. Well, good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you, and welcome to the White House. We are really, really thrilled that you're here. Um, Sonal and Marta and the rest of us, Divya, um, and along with our colleagues in the White House and across the administration have been working on this and thinking about this and talking about this for a very long time. So it's a pleasure to see today finally come together. You know, I don't have to tell you that the impact economy is growing that it is rapidly growing. And we see it here in the Obama administration as being a critical part of our domestic policy agenda. I mean, we know that business has a critical role to play in not only growing the economy, but also making, taking important steps forward to address the critical challenges that we're facing in society. And whether that be education or housing or health care or clean energy or job training, the list goes on and on. The role that you all are playing makes a huge, huge difference in our work. And we know that for a long time, there are a lot of people who have said that you can't have economic prosperity and success and also drive forward on social good at the same time. But we think that people who think that way are creating artificial barriers. And we think quite the opposite, that many of you have, <laughs> many of you, um, have been constructing important nonprofit organizations, dynamic businesses, and you've been employing all of these techniques and all of these skills that prove that we can have economic good and social good and prosperity at the same time. As you are doing business differently, we also realize that those of us in the administration have to do business differently as well. And today is the beginning, but it's also a result of that kind of thinking. And we want to support and encourage this growing sector, and we want to leverage the market-based models that already exist and those that will continue to grow. To achieve these shared goals, we've been partnering with our colleagues in the National Economic Council, and in a minute you're going to hear from my colleague and my partner, Gene Sperling, um, and he will talk about that. And we already have an interagency group that's put together that help to construct today's agenda, but also we'll be doing the work going forward while we work with our colleagues across the administration. 
So we've brought those of you here from all different sectors, whether it's business or philanthropy or corporations, those of you who are small entrepreneurs and others, to have a tough conversation with us, a very honest conversation with us, because we want to better understand what the barriers are to what you're doing and how we can errat eliminate those barriers and how we can encourage the sector and also think about other kinds of changes, other things that we can do from a policy perspective and from you know, the White House perspective to try and encourage and support your work. As I said, we think that today is just the beginning and we hope that the sessions that you'll have that Sonal just described will allow you to have those, the fruitful conversations that I just mentioned and also to share information with each other as well as with us so that we can further catalyze this sector. And we look forward to continuing the work with the Aspen Institute. They've been great partners in helping us put today's session together. And they're also going to work with us to synthesize what we get out of today's sessions so that we can put out a report that you all will see later this summer. So we look forward to hearing all of your thoughts and getting your input. As I said, having those honest conversations, and I, I'm sure I probably don't have to say it to this group, but we really want to hear what you're thinking and what's going on and what will be useful and helpful, because that's the only way that we're going to be able to deploy that in the work that we're doing and to further develop this agenda. So I'm going to close now, but I, again, I want to thank you for being here. Um, as I said in a minute, you're going to hear from my colleague, um, Gene Sperling, who you know, such a treasure. He, he wears kind of the chief green eye share, shade pocket protector wear around here, but he's got a social sector heart, um, and that's one of the reasons I really enjoy working with him. But before you hear from Gene, I want to introduce the chief of staff um, to the president, Bill Daly. I think many of you probably know him or know him by reputation. Um, he is a wonderful leader here in the White House, and he also understands that sweet spot um, between uh, doing social good and also economic prosperity and growing the economy and growing jobs. So with that, I want to turn this over to our Chief of Staff, William Daly. I thought I was introducing Melody at some point. Am I turning it back to you? Oh, Gene. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I've got a real job, I guess. I'm going to do Gene. Uh, let me uh, thank you all for being here today. I appreciate it. Um, welcome to the White House. Uh, obviously, this is a gathering looking at the list of some great representatives of companies who are involved in impact investing. Uh, quite challenging, obviously, at this time, but extremely important. Uh, the President believes that we are all in this together. Obviously, lots of people look to the government. What can you do? We have These are difficult times. You know it. Uh, difficult times in businesses and philanthropy, uh, in the overall economy, the challenges we've got in the government right now with uh, a tremendous debt that's uh, built up over years. Um, so it's a, it's a tough time out there. We've got to be creative. Uh, this is what you do uh, every day and what you try to do. Obviously, uh, I had the pleasure when I was at J.P. Morgan of overseeing our corporate responsibility, and I know there are some people. I see John Hooley and, and uh, I think Christine is here from, from J.P. Morgan. And there are lots of great companies, as I say, represented here. And um, we need your help. We need your innovation. We need your creativity. Um, obviously, uh, you've got challenges as you look to try to make some impactful investing. Um, and you've got the challenges of dealing with real metrics, the responsibilities you've got uh, to, your, to the shareholders, to the investors, uh, and to, to really make judgments about what can be impactful uh, with the money that we can find, the resources, the financial gap that's out there um, in, in attracting real money to, to, to make a difference. So social investing, impact investing, whatever, however you want to call it, the responsibility of all of us to join together to try to change uh, this world uh, and to do some good, uh, do well and, and, and do good, as Ron, my friend Ron Brown used to say. Uh, that's the challenge you've got. Uh, we've got that challenge to do it with fewer resources uh, at the federal government, but we are trying to be much more creative, as you try to do. Um, but so we, we thank you for being here. We want to hear your ideas. Obviously, you've got some great participants from the government that are here. We hope to, to uh, be helpful to you. We need to hear from you what you think we can do to make 
uh, opportunities for your investing and, and to address some of these inherent problems in our society and worldwide, uh, try to address them. And so we really do want to hear from you. We do a lot of, uh, generally in this town, as you know, um, those of us who have been around a while, generally the, the rap is, you know, we all say we want to listen to you, then everybody talks for about 20 minutes, uh, and then say they have to run, okay? So, so that's what we do. But the truth is, um, we really do, um, and I think it is important. Uh, I, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions for a few minutes. I know Gene's coming up. Uh, Gene has been intimately involved in, a, in every issue um, in this administration, uh, the economic difficulties we've got. He's been at the core of uh, the budget discussions with the vice president, trying to, and, the, and these are tough dis things. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a belief over the last 30 years that the answer to all of our ills is to cut spending and, and um, cut revenue. And uh, I, I think that model's been proven wrong, but that's our belief. There are others who believe strongly the other way. So we've got to do more with less, as you do every day, and find creative ways to to uh, do the things that we think really matter to society and make this a better place for all of us. That's what we're here for. The rest of it is a lot of BS. So, so the bottom line is we thank you for being here, and we do, we do want to hopefully have a little engagement. I know there's a, a, a bunch of panels, a bunch of presenters. So I'll open it up. If, if I can answer any questions, I'll do it. If not, I'll just tell you Gene's the expert, and he'll answer everything, any question you can imagine having on any subject. Your personal problems, whatever you got, you know, stuck to G. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll open it up and see if I can answer anything. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Scott Sklar, and I do uh, projects, green technology, manufacturing in states, and and uh, moving new manufacturing in. And of course, that takes blending capital from the feds, the private capital markets, state and local governments, including in the city of Chicago. The question that used, I have, to, that used to be of interest to me. To I know it's not interesting, anymore. <laughs> but but the um, the question I have for you is, and it relates to your, to, in some ways, to, to your illusion that uh, we have the government officials that say we really care for this, and I, I actually respect that, and that's good. But when it's then handed off to the to the agencies to work together, um, somehow the agency lawyers and the contract people get bogged down in, in ways that are very reasonable for them, but don't drive projects. So it seems to me, your White House Chief of Staff, is how do you coordinate the agencies in a way operationally to get to yes, and get to yes in a, in a, in a year rather than in four years? You know, you, the, the, at the heart of your question is something that I hear all the time in one version of another. Right. And there is a lot of silos in this government. Right. and. We've got to be aware early on, to be frank with you, from you all, when, as best we, you can, that you know, the, the time is vital here. And when we know that, we can push people, left to their own devices, to be very honest with you, the system kind of grinds along. You know, you know, manana, don't worry about it. You know, we'll do, get to it. So, so what? We need mechanisms to be able to do that. Well, so. we, we have an interagency process that can move that quickly. Okay. On the NEC, um, you know, when things come to the NEC, when things come to Gene's attention, uh, w that we really believe can be in, in, impactful to the economy, impactful to certain sectors, you know, we try to drive that very, very uh, uh, strongly from the White House. Um, but we've got to be made aware of things that look like it's going to be, you know, we can, we, we try to attempt, we attempt to try to change the processes, uh, but these entities are, are uh, difficult to move. Uh, except when there's a crisis. We are in a crisis. We're trying to get some people to understand that this is a real crisis and the ways in which things happen in this town have got to be jump-started based upon the difficulty we're in. And I think we're having results there. I think we are seeing that uh, with a lot of the programs. I think a lot of the Recovery Act um, uh, efforts that were taken and, and that were acted upon rather quickly compared at least to historical uh, timelines for the government uh, have shown real reaction to that. But we've got to be made aware of these things quickly uh, so we can find a way to circumvent what would be the normal system, which is what you laid up. Uh, again, uh, let me introduce, uh, I, I say this, there is no one who works harder, other than the president, of course, I always got to say that. Uh, 
<laughs> on these 18 acres and contributes more to the dialogue in this place, a positive dialogue than Gene Sperling. So it's honored for me to introduce our NEC director. Gene. Um, thanks so much. Let me, uh, um, let me start by uh, first um, thanking or acknowledging a few people. Uh, one is Melody Barnes, who has shown enormous leadership uh, in this area and in her department um, uh, in domestic policy. And we, we do work together. And the answer to your question is the way things work is that it's not agency versus White House. Uh, the way Melody and I uh, operate is that we're the honest brokers. We bring the departments around. And when things are, and, and, and the fact that this is driven out of the White House uh, is a perfect example. Of course, it doesn't mean we do everything. It means we bring people together. We make sure we're getting all the ideas we're presenting to the president. There are some issues where it's just the National Economic Council will do most of it, but they'll be at the table. There's others where domestic policy runs. This is one that is so uh, intimately related to the, you know, the fundamental goals of domestic policy and many of the means of the economic team that we work together uh, in partnership. So there is, there's just a very, very strong linkage. And I, uh, uh, I've um, uh, been honored to have this job since January, but long before that, Melody was, was showing great leadership on it. Second person I want to acknowledge is Sonal Shaw. Sonal has been to everywhere, from, including Bosnia, with me at, for different ventures, and she has had such a passion and leadership for this and what she's done with her, her family uh, uh, in India, what she's done professionally, corporate responsibility-wise, what she's done here. She has been just a driving passion for this, and she's one of my favorite people, and I want to acknowledge her. And finally, uh, another woman who's been just a star in this area is Ginger Liu, and I have to acknowledge her because it's her last few days. She makes things happen. She makes things happen even with when resources are tight, regional innovation cluster working on this, and our only uh, comfort uh, that sh uh, she is departing for a more normal life is that she will be uh, just on this side of the podium the next time uh, we're doing any of these things. So I really just wanted to acknowledge uh, all three of them. Let me just make uh, uh, three points. And again, as Bill said, uh, you are the experts, but just three thoughts, really. One, um, you know, I think this area uh, is beyond just uh, economics. I mean, it does go to sense of purpose and sense of mission for people. And I think that anybody engaged broadly in our economy uh, likes to believe that they're a part of the, an overall system that, in general, has worked over time, over the last couple of centuries, to create greater opportunity. Um, but for a lot of people, just having that general and vague sense is not enough. They want to see that connection. They want to be able to explain that connection to their friends, to their family, to themselves, to their God. They want to be able to see very clearly how what they are doing through their entrepreneurship, through their private sector, through their nonprofit sector is having uh, uh, those results. And that's, I, I think there are just, there are a, a lot of amazing people uh, coming out of school into the workforce, people already there who want to see that connection tighter. They want to feel that every day in their lives. And I think you can talk about all the other things, but I think it is that personal sense of purpose and mission that drives the social entrepreneur world, that drives the uh, uh, impact investing world. Um, and uh, uh, um, secondly, um, I just, and related, is, um, I mean, I, double bottom line is the kind of common phrase that we use, but uh, I often think a double bottom line is often just kind of a code for a single bottom line that is just richer and more long term. Uh, I think often when we say double bottom line, it means that it doesn't fit into the most narrow quarterly sense of what is in the interest of the particular enterprise. Uh, I think those, I, I think much of this happens when people take a richer view, a longer term view. I remember my fr friend Maria Eitel uh, at Nike 
giving an interview once where she said after some of the child labor issues came out that workers there were ashamed to tell people at picnics who they worked for. That is not just a double bottom line. That goes to the reputation, the type of people that you get, the pride people have in the enterprises they're working for. That may be double bottom line. I think it's for a lot of companies and organizations. It's more of a richer and more deeper and reflective long-term sense of what is in, in that their interest. Secondly, um, all of us benefit Anybody, particularly in the private sector, has to benefit ultimately that people have confidence that things work in a way that leads to shared prosperity. I mean, the goal of our country from Ben Franklin, from the revolution, was we were not a country in which the outcome of your life was based on the accident of your birth. That like our economy just didn't have GDP, it created opportunity and it was an opportunity that was broadly shared. We are not a dumbbell economy with people on one side, a lot of people on one side, a lot on the other, and just a thin uh, line in the middle. We're the dumbbell uh, economy. Uh, we want most of the people in the middle, a sense of opportunity that when there is growth and productivity, it's not only benefiting the economy as a whole, but the values that more people can move up and share in the prosperity. That is more important today than ever before. People are doubting that more than ever before. We see counties across our country with 15 percent uh, unemployment and more still reeling from the worst financial crisis that many of the people suffering from had little to do with in contributing. So it is also a richer sense of what is best for all of the long term for, for everyone. Uh, so I believe that that kind of uh, depth in terms of the reputation, in terms of the, the motivation and the type of people you hire, in terms of the overall confidence in the system, uh, really does to me mean that sometimes double bottom line just simply means a more longer term and more reflective view of what is a, a, a single bottom line. And third, I think it is just driven by a sense of the, a greater understanding standing in recent times of the importance of both entrepreneurship and sustainability. And I think there's more of you, more people thinking that being able to do things that in your core area where there is expertise gives a richer and more sustainable benefit than just contributing sometimes and more people thinking in their, whether it's in their corporate responsibility, whether it's in their investment practices, asking themselves whether uh, beyond writing a check, which can be absolutely crucial, is there a model that is more sustainable, richer, draws more on the internal resources you have to have something that is a deeper and richer connection? And on the other hand, when you are writing checks, writing them to those who show that commitment, that entrepreneurship, that sustainability, where you say, no, actually, it isn't better to recreate the wheel. Here's somebody doing it well, and we should support them because they're exhibiting the entrepreneurship and the sustainability that will, will do well. So I think, you know, in the administration, we think about this often, our initiatives, things like the community, uh, the CDFI, community development banks, the new markets tax credit, the impact fund that Karen Mills is leading. These things are all very much designed to support the social impact investing, the leveraging, the core sustainability, the entrepreneurship, and empowering that. And, you know, uh, uh, this will be my only thing that approaches a political statement, is to say it is my hope, and it doesn't have to be all of your hope, but it's my hope that we're just barely through a quarter of the uh, President Obama's uh, presidency, which means that I hope we're just a quarter of the way through the new ideas we will do. So we're not here just to tell you what we've done. Uh, we're here to hear because we, we're hoping to be around for a while, and we're hoping that we're just 25 percent through the new ideas. Uh, uh, so please uh, don't feel like anything's too late. There is a long time. It is going to be a long climb back from this deep recession. Uh, it's a long climb back to the kind of economy we want, and we will be needing the ideas that you have for a while, whether it's us or someone else. So thank you very much. Thank you to Melody and to uh, Sonal and Ginger, and I will let you move on. Thank you.
Thank you all. Um, I would like to bring up our panel, our uh, opening panel, uh, we'll, which will be led by Joanne Lippman. She is a, one of the nation's most prominent uh, journalists and commentators. Her C-suite column in Newsweek features interviews with business leaders, and as a media advisor, uh, she's also a commentator on leading news shows such as uh, CNN. She was founder and editor-in-chief in Condé Nast Portfolio and Portfolio.com, and previously the deputy managing editor of the Wall Street Journal, and the first woman actually to attain that post, which is great. Um, and I will let Joanne introduce everybody. We're going to turn their name cards around <laughs> so everybody can see them and, uh, and have everybody uh, please come on up. Uh, please uh, follow start with the panel. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you so much, Sonal. It's, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be here representing um, Newsweek and Daily Beast, um, which both are extremely, they've just merged, you probably know, under Tina Brown. And uh, this has been social innovation, social investing is, is a real interest um, of Newsweek, Daily Beast, and something that we are increasingly involved in, along with this Women in the World um, initiative. And actually, um, I've got a colleague, Kim Azzarelli, who should be in the audience somewhere if she wants to raise her hand. Who, there she is, who's going to be leading one of the breakout panels and can talk more about that later. Um, I'm going to ask everybody just briefly to, to, to um, just give us your name and your affiliation, and then we're going to launch right into questions. And I guess we should start with Elizabeth. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Littlefield. I think I know many of you out here. Uh, I'm the president and CEO of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is the U.S. government's development finance institution. Uh, are we stopping at that uh, title? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just so, this is just so we okay, all know great. who everyone is. I'm Adam Lowry. I'm the founder of Method. We make soap. <laughs> <laughs> John Goldstein, Imprint Capital. We create and manage mission investing programs with foundations, families, and financial institutions. Morning. Cheryl Dorsey. I run Echoing Green. We're angel investors in the social sector. Hi, I'm John Buley from J.P. Morgan. I work in our social finance group. So thank you, everybody, for being here. This is an amazingly distinguished panel. I wish we had an hour with each one of you individually. Um, just for starters, you know, it's interesting. The Monitor Group report, which I think many people here have read, had estimated that, that impact investing could grow to be a $500 billion industry in the next decade. JP Morgan has estimated it could be a trillion dollar um, industry in the next decade. And, and I think that I'm going to ask some tough questions today because I think there is uh, one of the issues that we all have with this industry is that it's a little bit fuzzy. I think to the outside world, people outside of this room, there is a lack of clarity about exactly what it is. And um, so I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to press a little bit so that we understand because I think as as Jean mentioned, you know, some people are kind of reinventing the wheel, and um, we we really want to I think uh, create some real clarity around this industry, which seems to be the most important step in in helping it grow and develop. Um, I'd like to start with the the just the question of how are we defining impact investing? Um, and I do think that there is a little bit of confusion between impact investing versus socially responsible investing. I know Elizabeth had a, had a view on that that you may want to share with us. Well, I mean, as you say, but between socially responsible investing, the world talks about, what, $4 trillion that's out there, out there that's dedicated to socially responsible investing. Whether you believe in that number is your decision. But the vast majority, of course, of it is in Europe, it's shareholder engagement strategies. In the US, it tends to be negative screens or best in class strategies. Then a smaller group of, that's the vast majority. Then there's a smaller amount which is focused on the application of environmental, social, and, and governance factors that uh, minimum criteria. And then an even smaller number that I think meets the test that we're talking about here, which is, which is investing with the intent to have social, economic, uh, benefits alongside financial returns. So I think that that test of intent is 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 um, is very important. Um, and frankly, you know, questioning that for whether you, whether you think it's 50, 50 billion or a trillion, fr frankly, to me is irrelevant because even if this sector gets the tiny little scrap of the financial markets broadly, it can make a huge difference to some of the, the, the projects in which we're investing. So I think there's too much focus on the si size of the market. All we know here is that it is growing incredibly rapidly, and it's growing because people care about having their monies invested in a way that's consistent with their values, because young people want to be working in sectors that are consistent with that. Um, and, and we see it every day. In fact, let me just finish by saying that OPEC just announced the results of our call for, fund, for proposals for, for impact investing funds. 
Um, and we had, we had said earlier we hope to put $250 million to work investing in impact investing funds. And we had 88 different fund managers applied, fund managers who were proposing to OPIC to, to provide financing to their private equity funds. That is an extraordinary number of applicants. We're so breaking uh, some news here. Yeah, that's no, great. that's that's that's, how, that's <laughs> late breaking news. So I just think it's it's this, it, this is a tiny subsector of this of the socially responsible investing market. It's growing fast, and even if it's one percent or even a half one percent of the total markets, it's going to make a big difference. You know, l let me just pick up on that, though. I think that the, the reason that we want to know the size of it is just it's just a, um, a, a place marker for understanding yep. what social what, what impact investing is. And I want to throw out we are in a room of converts here. We are we are speaking to the converted already. But outside of this room, there are a lot of people who question the need for impact investing. The, the argument being, um, if you're investing, it should be for investment returns, and if you want to do philanthropy, that's terrific, but when you merge the two, you are not giving the best, you're not getting the best of either. And I, I'd like to, the, just playing devil's advocate, to ask the panel, to, how do you respond to that kind of criticism, skepticism in the marketplace? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think the inherent in that statement is an assumption that uh, doing social good or environmental good and financial good at the same time are opposed to one another. And uh, there's a lot of businesses out there that in what they're doing, their objective is to try to align those interests. So as their business grows, they're creating more positive impacts or, or, or more benefit environmentally or socially. Um, and then there's also, of course, there are still times when there are trade-offs between those things. But a lot of times what you, what you learn is that those trade-offs are only there because there's incumbent older economy businesses that have scale that make the things you want to do that are a little bit more socially or environmentally responsible more expensive today. But the only reason they're more expensive today is because of those issues of this yeah. scale and incumbency. And if we can overcome those things and we can work together to try to create that, then it'll become easier and easier over time to create these types of businesses where as they grow, they create more good, not more bad. And, and is your purpose in your company, for example, is it more, how do you weigh social versus financial? Well, look, exactly as I just mentioned, which is we're always looking for ways where we're trying to align those things together. And then where there are trade-offs, um, we try to do the right thing. And we have a set of metrics that we use to try to measure all this stuff. And then what we do is we actually balance. Uh, we're, we're lucky enough to be a private business, I should mention that. So we're lucky, we're lucky enough to be able to balance with our shareholders and our board uh, ideas of doing the right thing and and. and building the bottom line at the same time. So you, you mentioned this great question of metrics, and, and maybe John or John or Cheryl could, could address this, um, which is, I think, a, a, one of the major, major issues in this industry is how do you measure? What is the right way to measure social return? And will there ever be a standard measurement that investors can apply the way that they can apply financial measures right now? It it, our belief is it will take a while, as did the creation of S&P and Moody's take a while. But there's significant positive work being done by many people at you know, Gears, Iris, B-Lab, and others, and many others, too many to name, who are defining and measuring those metrics. Challenge is, one, there's no one-size-fits-all, because you cannot measure the efficacy of, of someone who is building wells in Africa versus someone doing eyesight in healthcare in India versus job creation in the United States. Uh, so it is an evolving, it is evolving activity. And as our research report showed, uh, it, it's, 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 there's room for everyone. And there will be common standards, and it will be sooner than any of us expect, just like there's more people in this room than I would have expected two years ago. I, I have sort of an unsatisfyingly messy answer, which I think is, a, which is, I think, a theme for this, because we talk about the impact economy, impact investing, and I think one of the really important things is that tension between the movement building focus to get, generate enthusiasm among people, among investors, that thinks about it as one thing, but the messy reality of the reality, it's a lot of different things trying to do different things for different reasons, and success looks quite differently. And I think the, the reality is metrics mean very different things for different people. There's a role to use metrics to organize the market so that people with great distribution can create products effectively in the marketplace. 
Then there are philanthropists that are saying, wait a second, I'm using this to have a very specific impact and I want to know, A, am I achieving that? B, am I achieving in a way that's superior to other approaches to doing that? C, am I screwing something else up in the process? It's a much more day-to-day -day decision. And I think that, that this is one of those things we all struggle with, is how do we not degenerate into kind of the broad generalizations when reality is, you know, reality is messy, but the messiness also can be a real turnoff to folks that, you know, once we get into our paragraphs and paragraphs, we say, it just I sort of want to move on. And metrics is one of those areas where it's going to be messy. There's a lot of work. People are kind of starting to disentangle the different uses of different metrics for different things. But I think it also is important that it's not a panacea. I think there is a perception that two things will happen if we, quote, get the metrics right. One, vast sums of money sitting on the sidelines that have just been waiting for better measures will suddenly flow into this practice. And two, the money that goes into impact will go to highest and best social use. And I don't think either of those are actually particularly true. It doesn't mean this is not unbelievably important and drives better actions, better market creation, but I think it, we can get into kind of the, the, the panacea hopefulness. Uh, it's a little bit of a dangerous, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a, 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 a flame for our collective mothdom. Uh, actually, why is it that you say that you don't believe it's true, particularly this first issue? Be because the conventional wisdom seems to be that if there are metrics that we can all get our hands around in, that there would be this giant pot of money with investors on the side who say, yeah, I'd love to get into it. I just need to understand how to measure the impact. But you're saying that, that you don't believe that that is True. You don't think that there are a lot of invest. There's not a lot of investment dollars that would come in as a result of standardized metrics. I, and then once again, it gets much more finely grained. To get retail investors and create retail products that have some sort of certification or stamp of sort of impact, authenticity, and quality assurance. Absolutely, that unlocks very specific pots of money. Within targeted impact sectors, can foundations align as they get greater clarity around the highest impact approaches? Absolutely. Those are probably different metrics. Those are probably different tools and approaches. And so I think it's, the, it's not a one metric solution to solve everything. It's advancing the practice of metrics to do very specific tactical things within the work. So the infrastructure that is surrounding this industry, do we expect it, John or Cheryl, do we expect this, this industry, the, the, the infrastructure to, to gain some clarity in these next couple of years? Or, or is this something that's just a false hope? I mean, I would say, I guess along with Adam, I sort of sit on the demand side of the equation. I mean, we're funding social entrepreneurs who are looking at a range of revenue models, right? We've got some who are using strictly philanthropic capital. We've got some folks who are starting B corporations. We've got some folks who are doing hybrid enterprises. Um, and I actually think they're quite comfortable with that messiness. You know, they're going to use whatever tool is in their toolkit to sort of get to the greatest social impact. So from my perspective, sort of the numbers matter. We have some data that shows there are probably already about 50,000 mission drivers businesses in this country, that's a unstoppable force and it will only grow, um, as folks were saying. And we're just out there doing it. Like when I look at our collection of social entrepreneurs who are doing this work, they're using a variety of metrics. Some folks are using IRIS. Our social entrepreneurs, we work with them to implement sort of pulse portfolio measures to sort of go out to investors and show their social and environmental returns on investment. Um, and that's important. And from our perspective, from a movement building perspective, the fact that you're starting to move from activity outputs, outcomes, to a conversation around impact is a seismic shift that really matters in this space. Investment capital follows a well-defined investment thesis of which, of which goals can be measured against achievements therefrom. So however one defines it in their vehicle that they create, that is the accountability that, that investors will seek. And the narrower that focus is, the easier it is to obtain that kind of capital. And for that reason, uh, Elizabeth just mentioned she had, uh, or OPIC had 88 responses to the call for funds. It was defined, it had clarity, it was specific. The SBA in creating the impact fund, place-based, sector-based. So it's defined, it's narrow, it has clarity, and people will respond to that. Investment capital has a more difficult time when it's fuzzy, and that's where you do get to, the, to your uh, initial comment of, we want to do good. It's hard, to, it's hard to conceptualize that, and it's hard to measure doing good. If I can just add to that, I think you mentioned vast sums of capital flowing into the market, and I think we all should be cautious that that would probably be a very damaging thing if it comes too early, too hot, and with too high expectations. So I would just, I would echo the comments that Cheryl and John and John have made as well. I think it's more nuanced infrastructure that is required, financial instruments that are 
particularly targeted to needs and gaps of the sector. And you know, when I think about when I think about you know the role that we're that we're trying to play, the OPEC's trying to play, and I think that the government more broadly would like to see it find ways that it can be supportive. It's you know filling those kind of financing gaps that are quite specific, longer tenors, more mature capital, more more patient capital, going to markets that others others won't go to, frankly more attractive financing terms. So filling the gaps would be one. Secondly, is finding risk mitigating products. The capital is there, but just needs some way to, to, to either create incentives so that the investment is a little bit more attractive and therefore feasible, or, or finding other ways to mitigate risk, I think, is important. And then there's other bits of infrastructure which we could go, go into in more detail, but things like liquidity facilities so that investors can exit when they want to exit is, is incredibly important. Funds of funds, because some of these investments are so small that they're too small for an investor to invest in. We need to aggregate them into funds of funds, for example. So there's um, you know, fixed income products that are socially responsible to invest liquidity when you're waiting to be able to invest capital. So I think there's a number of different products, certainly that we would love to work on together with, with all of you and all of you to find ways to really tailor that financing to the risks and gaps that the market needs. Because I do worry about unleashing floodgates of excited retail demand on this, on this nascent field. So you think that before that happens, what we need to have are additional instruments yes. that are that, that of the sort that you mentioned. Are there others? Are there other other sorts of vehicles or instruments that we should be thinking about in this industry? I mean, you mentioned a number of them. Um, are there other barriers that are preventing us from kind of seeing this industry grow further? What what would be the major barriers that you see? Again, I'll take it from the demand side. Um, you know, it's interesting. A lot of the work in this space has really been focused on, right, how do you drive new capital into the space? But, you know, a lot of us talk about the need to really provide more supports for entrepreneurs, right? You've got mm -hmm. some really amazing entrepreneurs with game-changing ideas, but they need technical support. And there are models out there that we think for technical assistance, advisory services, that could be potentially useful. Um, my, my colleague, John Walker, brought to my attention uh, a really interesting model out of a family office in Switzerland. It's Responsibility AG, which is this 14 million euro fund that actually has alongside it a 1 million side fund for technical assistance. So if there's deal flow in the pipeline that's not quite ready, not quite investable, there is sort of pre and post technical assistance um, before the investment happens to help these businesses get ready. And that sort of technical support mechanism is really important if we're going to drive more deal flow into the pipeline. And do you think we have sufficient technical support no. mechanism now? So no. how do we get there? Well, I think that's, again, where the infrastructure and sort of intermediary groups like Echoing Green do matter. So, you know, so Matt from Blue Ridge Foundation. So there are groups of us who are starting to aggregate the deal flow and also bring technical supports to the table through networking, through helping them navigate this new space of metrics. How do you um, work with gears? How do you work with IRIS? How do you work with Pulse? Um, so we're beginning to create that capacity, but we've got a long way to go. But it is happening. Uh, around the country. When you talk about aggregating deal flow, just explain that a little bit more. So you're talking about taking a lot of small deals that are too small for... I I'm just talking about pipeline. So, uh -huh. you know, where do burgeoning startup entrepreneurs go for capital, technical assistance, access to broader ne networks to get the next tranche of capital? And there are groups like Echoing Green, Blue Ridge Foundation, Acumen Fund, who are out there looking for these entrepreneurial <laughs> solutions that are driving social impact and sort of bringing them together to sort of match the capital right. with these sort of mission-aligned investors. So I just want to make sure I understand. So the aggregation you're talking about is where these it's it's from that pipeline side from yes, from these from entrepreneurs the pipeline, yes. who were who want to come in and you feel that that needs to be more there, there needs to be more clarity for them about yes. where to go yes. and how to get their funding yeah. Yeah. I mean, for, from my perspective i think um, just from the perspective of somebody trying to grow a business like this um, I, I see a lot of businesses that are socially or environmentally responsible that are small and medium-sized i don't see a lot of them are that are yet huge and have supplanted traditional businesses. And I think that um, a lot of the barriers that that you encounter as a business like this end up coming at that stage where you're trying to, to beat the incumbents that um, with, with a different type of business model. And I think that that's where, from my perspective, we should focus on trying to, to grow the sector. I, I, in other words, I think that uh, the venture community and, and the way things work today 
well serves this idea of separating the wheat from the chaff of who's, who are the good entrepreneurs, what are the good ideas, that sort of thing, getting things going. Uh, and, and then each industry, I think industry has a tendency over time to build barriers against upstarts. And I think they're peculiar to different industries. In ours, they're weird things like slotting fees. I have to pay a million dollars to put a product on shelf, um, which is a huge barrier against people with innovative products coming to market. When I sell my product, uh, another one is category manage, management. When I want to sell my product to Cheryl at one of my retailers, John, who works for my competitor, I have to convince him to take his product off the shelf to put mine on, which means if I have anything less than already owning the market, there's, there's no reason to do that. So it creates, and these are peculiar things of my industry, but they exist in every industry. And I think that maybe perhaps that's a place where government can play a role, which is how do we, if we like this sector, if we like the types of things we're seeing out of the businesses that are coming up, how do we uh, level the playing field so that these businesses can really flourish and complete, compete on, on a level playing field with, with the incumbents in the space? Well, one of the biggest things on, in terms of kind of barriers, which I guess less of a barrier, but as sort of critical ingredient that gives me a tremendous amount of optimism, and it's been alluded to, Elizabeth was talking about it earlier, it's the people. It's having energetic, amazing entrepreneurial people at all points along this work. Starting businesses, investing in businesses, running organizations, working in government, having those entrepreneurial driven people trying to make this happen. And I think we've all seen a sea change in that in the last 10 years where you know, once upon a time this economy was people that had had a good career and wanted to maybe give something back. Or you know, just, and now this is a real set of industries that real people in the prime of their lives and careers, it's not just you know, idealistic, you know, this, is, this is where great talent wants to go in terms of making investments, in terms of starting businesses, all of these enterprises. And I think that's one of the huge things because you know, I, I think the point that Elizabeth made in terms of, I love the phrase, and I'm going to use it, nuanced infrastructure, I think is, <laughs> no, I think is really illustrative, which is there's no magic. This stuff takes work. Starting a business takes work. Doing due diligence and supporting a business that you invest in takes work. It takes good people doing a lot of work, and there's no magic thing that gets rid of that. But this nuanced infrastructure that can make it so if people are doing the work, some of the barriers get out of the way, that work can be leveraged, you know, that, that, that makes that work go to greater effect. And I think that's, that's that role that can be played to, to not sort of magically, you know, take something that is intrinsically difficult and make it easy. It's to kind of amortize the work you know, more effectively across more impact. The issue of scale in this in impact investing does not concern me because after all, this country has been founded with and, and has grown through small businesses getting bigger. So the absolute number of investment vehicles and the small size of them d does not concern me. And also to ask everyone to reflect, venture capital itself was a new industry that no one had heard of 40 years ago. What, what it behooves all of us, and one thing that, that our research has shown, and, and, and to not get so tied up in this definitional issue of is it doing good or is it making the most amount of money, this this rejection of the binary and the inclusion of everything from quasi-philanthropic to very much market-driven. There's room for everyone and there's room for different investors and, and room for different vehicles within that space. From, from uh, and, and I, I love Jean's, Jean's comment in introducing, in introducing double bottom line as a single bottom line with a long-term patient focus that Jean Sperling just said. In, in the early remarks, I mean that's a that lights for a wide gamut of one percent return to market ret market returns. So you're all hitting on on um, on the government here a little bit, and I, I actually want to clarify here: what can the government do? What should the government do? Is it best should the government just get out of the way? Like, what can the government do to assist in the growth <laughs> of this sector? But a very tactical thing that, that feels like there's a lot of momentum is using some of the tools it has to support the space. And I think the, the OPIC call that Elizabeth was talking about, which is how do we use this mechanism these tools OPIC has in a way that's creative to engage folks from a variety of sectors to, to, to try to use the tools we got to drive the impacts we want. Some of the stuff I saw, you know, Sean Green, others around the SBA and what they're doing. You know, using some of the tools that already exist is, is you know, it's, in some ways it's the easiest low-hanging fruit, but it takes some of that creativity because the tools aren't necessarily designed for that. So how do you adapt them, tweak them, work them within what you have? And I think step one is some ways having 
that engagement and that entrepreneurial energy of using the tools they have. And then, you know, I'll, I'll leave the, 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 the new proposals to others, but I think that, that it's been great to see that momentum and engagement, you know, just use what you got as, as, as a starting point. Anyone else? Let's, I, I think as those who have been involved in impact investing for a few years, uh, this group, our group at JP Morgan was created by Christina Leonhoved, uh, which was the name that Bill Daly was, was, was getting, Brian Trinket, uh, was, um, you know, have been very, very pleased with the, with the receptivity of USAID, of OPIC, of SBA, and of a whole host of others to, to really assist in the development of the infrastructure and the investment ideas here. So it's, um, I agree with John, uh, using the existing tools has, has been something very important. So um, I would just say to your, to your question, I mean, we are, we are trying to use the existing tool. OPIC's got a long history of investing for positive financial return as well as positive social return, which is why, thank heavens, we managed to pr produce money every year and give it back to the government, which is a nice thing to say these days. Um, but I do think those roles, that the roles that the government can play um, do range from finding ways that we can use our position, you know, to have more, be more patient and have longer term capital, charge attractive rates that the commercial market wouldn't do, go places that commercial investors would not go, uh, in terms of frontier markets, startup capital, uh, startup uh, businesses. So I think, again, it comes down to finding mechanisms that fill, fill financing gaps, that reduce risk that enhance returns and that innovate by using um, using the tools available within the government to create structures that are fitting fitting a specific need. The one thing I don't about I wish we did did have and don't have the capability to do is direct investment of equity and the direct uh, granting of technical assistance, which I think is a big need uh, in the market. Um, and certainly, technical assistance can be um, provided and is provided successfully by AID. But um, I think those are the kind of things that the government can do. Do you think that will happen? Excuse me? Do you think that we will get to the point where the government will provide those things? I, I believe that we, at least my agency is doing it on the international uh, level. I believe SBA is doing a lot of it on the domestic front. But it's, it's happening. I think it's happening. But it needs to much more engagement with the, with, with the sector itself to identify exactly what are the instruments and innovations and structures that are going to move, move investments forward. Um, so I think that dialogue is critically important because we're extremely keen to, um, you know, to, to support the sector as we have done. And I think we have some very interesting observations from the kind of investments that are out there as a result of this, this call for fund that show really good news in terms of things we didn't expect, you know, things like really strong partnerships between mainstream investors and social investors coming together to apply to the fund. Uh, investment funds from all over the world really evenly split among the regions. Frankly, all sectors that you can imagine, whether it's telecommunications or clean energy or microfinance or small and growing businesses, with not a lot in the infrastructure area, I must say. So I think that there's a really rich and vibrant community that's coming out of the woodwork now, and it's, it's time to engage to figure out how we can, we can do more to innovate to support them. And Cheryl, yeah. I was just going to say, it's, um, you know, talking about how do we mitigate some of the barriers is very important. I think there's also an important role um, for the government to sort of amplify and raise up what is already happening. You know, I think somebody uh, here today is from the Kauffman Foundation. They have some really interesting information showing that in 1985, there were only about 250 courses on entrepreneurship being taught at two-year and four-year colleges. Now there are over 3,000 around this country. So again, from the demand perspective, you've got a lot of young people um, who are using sort of the college ecosystem as a really fertile ground for thinking about and starting um, entrepreneurial ventures. And there's some interesting research, it's a little bit dated, but saying, you know, 18 to 24 year olds are now starting businesses at rates that outstrip those who are 35 to 44. So there's something coming here. And then how do you start to support that zeal that interest around entrepreneurial activity. And I think that's really important. The government can pay, play an important role in raising that up and supporting that, like the Startup America initiative that's already underway. That's a great point and actually leads to uh, an interesting observation here as I'm listening to all of you speak. Pretty much everyone here, and I think many people in this room, come from the orientation of the entrepreneur. And, and what do we do to ease the way for the entrepreneur? I want to turn that on its head for a moment and, and look at from the point of view of the investor. And the reason is I've been struck by several of your comments. As somebody who's coming from outside this industry as an observer, I've heard you say somewhat dis, you're somewhat 
dismissive of the need to quantify the return on investment for social return. I've heard you say that um, we have to be careful. We don't want a flood of retail investors coming in. So from the investment side, I think, um, you know, th there is still some confusion. There's also some messiness, as we're talking about, from the investor side. And I, I think we, I want to I hone in on that a little bit. The Monitor report that I think we all read from 2009 talks about we are in a phase of uncoordinated innovation. And it was either Monitor or the J.P. Morgan report that quoted a high net worth individual saying, the problem I have is I'm really interested in this sector. I'm having a hard time getting into it. There aren't people to advise me in this sector. Um, and, and so when I hear you guys being a little bit to outside ears, dismissive of the outside investors, I, I want to raise that question. How do we bring in the investors? And isn't it important to have some sort of very defined infrastructure here so that it's easier to bring in investment? I, I mean, I, I would say, I mean, and whether to be sort of be welcoming or dismissive of new investment, you know, it's happening. I think sort of that's sort of, you know, this is not something we all just choose. You know, do we bring new investors into this or don't we? You know, this is, what's amazing is the wave of appetite from family offices, from right. foundations, from, you know, from individual, from all different types of institutions to be involved in this and participate in this. It's, it's happening and it's real and it's not something where we can kind of like all tweak, tweak the knobs. I think it's a question, it's not a question of, you know, what do we generate or do we not? It's how do we all deal with it? And creating that capacity, which is a lot of the unglamorous, you know, nuanced infrastructure and the grotty plumbing, which is, right. you know, using some of the plumbing that we got, which are the JP Morgans of the world that have a lot of plumbing to do a lot of stuff, um, or creating new plumbing, with, you know, <laughs> which, which, you know, I see Ron, Ron Cordes and what he's doing with Impact Assets, a whole host of people, they're saying, you have people that want to put money in the space. You have you know, the, the folks that Cheryl's talking about that need the money. There actually needs to be a lot of stuff in here to make that happen, right. which some of which is infrastructure, some of which are firms, some of which are new firms. You know, and I think that's the area where people have all woken up to say, you're going to get a lot of frustrated people on both sides of this unless that really starts to, starts exactly. to take shape. Exactly, exactly. John is correct in that. It is happening, and it's going on now. It will happen faster, and it will happen more efficiently when, as, when, when more uh, people with already existing experience decide that impact investing is important to them and that they will dedicate not just their money, but that there's time and that you will see this. Private capital funds will cre be created with experienced investors, with people who have done this for a living. This is a very unique ecosystem here that is built, as, as Cheryl said, we've 250 courses up to 3,000 courses. That's, that's, that's enormous. I mean, we get asked to speak at colleges all of the time. You know, very few industries are created at the university level, but you have this, this, this amazing pool of talent of younger people that need to get some of the experience that they, that they can receive from people who have been involved in more mainstream businesses. And now we are seeing, and it's not just as a result of the financial crisis, more people from mainstream financial institutions, more people from mainstream companies who are saying, I want to do something consistent with my values, and I want to do it as part of my lifestyle and part of my career, and now there is this ability to do that where before people would just say, okay, I, I will work like a, a, a dog or whatever for however many years, and then I'll go into philanthropy. So this is creating something for those experienced people who, have, who, who can not just give back but can also find a way to, to help this industry. So I think John Goldstein uh, hitting on, I think what you hit on with the, the grotty infrastructure question is a really essential question to this industry, right? I mean, are we, are we on track to create that? Because as you, as you point out, John, there is this tremendous growth in this industry and there's huge interest. I have a college age kid and I can tell you they all want to go into this field. Um, do, are we on track to create the infrastructure that they're going to need? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Show of hands. <laughs> Rome, Rome was not built in a day. Rome was not built in a day. And there is a process by which businesses are formed and which industries are formed. And, and could it be growing faster? Yes. But it will be, as has been mentioned by several people on the panel, somewhat messy as this all develops. I think we're running out of time. I would like to ask one more question, which is, um, in terms of 
each of you, what, what keeps you up at night? What do you think is the, the biggest risk that we must address? It's something that we need to be thinking about, talking about today um, as we're thinking about this industry. Is there a risk of failure? Is there a risk of? <laughs> I'll, I'll say yeah. two, two, two things that I stress about. One is screwing it up. And I think it's something that we all carry with us in whatever we're doing and whether we're making investments, whether we're running a business. That, that, and I think one of the things that's exciting and makes this sector work is we all feel that on multiple levels, the stakes of our work are very real. It's not just that we run businesses and employ people, that we don't want to become the cautionary tale that's used to discourage people from putting their money, their time, their sweat, their love into this sector. And I think people feel that. I feel that everyone here feels it. But I think it's important to name that is that the sense of responsibility we all have, which is our failure, is can have disproportionately negative impact. I think that's, that's number one. Number two is you know, we're navigating these different tensions in this messy, uncoordinated way, and just hopefully kind of staying between kind of, you know, the silas and the crib die, you know, in, 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 in that front. And, you know, build the movement, talk about it as one thing, but don't forget it's actually more nuanced and messy, but don't get people's eyes to glaze over because it's complicated. You want to be enthusiastic and supportive, but don't overpromise. You want to show that you're delivering and being grounded and real, but occasionally you got to pick your head up and share. I mean, you know, we have a, 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 you know, a client that's done the quietest $80 million of market-oriented mission investing for a foundation ever without issuing a press release. You know, there's certain, like, you want to do the work, but you got to share. You know, you need to, and, and finding, kind of navigating through that, both individually and collectively. So don't screw it up and then kind of, you know, balance between these, these different dynamics as we go through that kind of messy process of market creation. What, um, yeah, what I worry about, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how to do this, but there's a lot of smart people in the room, is I, I worry about making sure that we have innovation across all different sectors of the economy. As, as a business that makes a lot of stuff, we're dependent on innovative materials, you know, these chemicals, plastics, things like that. And we do a lot of that innovation ourselves, but we're also dependent on a lot of other partners for that type of innovation. And from my perspective, I see a lot of this sector, um, there's a lot of focus on energy and things like that. But when it comes to base materials, chemicals, plastics, stuff like that, um, I, I don't see as much real big innovation as I'd like to see. And I think part of it is because they're not as sexy, they're not as consumer facing, and they're huge. And so they take enormous amounts of capital to reinvent things like how do we get off of you know, petroleum based chemicals, for example. So um, I, I'm, that's what worries me. I'm not sure how to get after it. And I'm not sure whether we need to worry about it or it's a problem that fixes itself because the opportunities are there for people to come in and innovate. But uh, I hope that we see more innovation and entrepreneurs in that space. Uh, because I think that's actually where there's big returns to be made. Innovation is great, but incrementalism is not bad either. And if there's anything that I worry about is the, 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 the possibility of unmet expectations in that between this groundswell of, of young people who are coming into this field, the significant inputs of the U.S. government, many state governments, and, and international organizations, as well as the number of investors, that we not create expectations that this can be created overnight. And we worry about that every day, that, that, it, it, that, that we try to harness some of this growth to make sure it works in a positive way. I mean, I would uh, echo what everyone has said, and you know, at Echoing Green, we worry about a lot of stuff. You know, we're, we're working <laughs> with these burgeoning entrepreneurs um, who come to you with their hopes and your dreams, and a lot of them fail, but some of them do succeed. And you know, we do talk a lot about how much capital, um, but we also talk about the structure of capital. For a lot of these entrepreneurs, the cost of acquiring and managing capital gets really expensive, and it weighs down these startup enterprises in particular. So, how do we get smarter and think more? Um, you know, more expertly about how do you provide this capital in ways it can be incorporated and used to highest effect. So that's that's a tough one that we're still trying to figure out. I would uh, just say two things. One, I would certainly echo what John said, as I think we, I, I worry a lot about the overpromising that leads to disappointment, that leads to backlash, that leads to cynicism. And I think that would be a really sad trajectory <laughs> for this, uh, this sector to go. So that's the first thing I worry about. The second thing is, um, the, I guess, Small is beautiful, but big is necessary. So I feel, in some ways, the way we've defined the impact investing sector with the intent so front and center, which I would fully embrace, we need to find, make sure that we find ways to bring in the mainstream corporate sector who can have a huge impact on the way we use the planet's resources, on the trajectory of, frankly, humankind over the next 
couple of generations. So this is great on the entrepreneur side, but we need to find ways to get the Coca-Colas and the Cargills and the Honeywells and the Boeings of the world embracing uh, a new way of doing business as well. And if we don't do that, I think we're, we're, we're going to be focusing too narrowly. And I would just add that I think what I've learned today is, is there is this enormous, enormous groundswell of interest in this area, and it does seem that the infrastructure is certainly an issue that needs to have more attention paid to it and uh, needs to be able to keep up to, to, to continue that growth. I want to thank everyone on our panel. I think you've all really helped the conversation and, and teed things up for the rest of the conversation today. You've raised some phenomenal issues, and thank you, everyone, for... Thank you. Participating. What is your child want to go to school? Yes, Let me add my thanks to all the panelists for setting the stage for today's proceedings. My name is Ginger Liu. I'm with the National Economic Council. Um, and I'm delighted to be a part of this uh, p particular convening. It is something that Sonal and I have worked on for quite some time. And uh, the fact that I'm able to participate this in my last couple of days here at the White House makes it even more meaningful. I'd also like to extend our appreciation to uh, at the Aspen Institute, who is co-hosting this event with us. And you will see in your breakout sessions uh, representatives from the Aspen Institute uh, providing assistance and serving as moderators and note takers. It is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, K Administrator Karen Mills, who I had the pleasure of meeting uh, during the transitions uh, uh, period, uh, after, right after the November elections. And I recall how we used to sort of slug our way through the snow uh, over to the transition office, uh, working these insane hours uh, because we were trying to uh, get a sense of what had happened with the agencies and uh, with the policies the last uh, few years uh, and establish that as a baseline in terms of you know, identifying what, our, uh, what we had to work with and what our new direction might be. And I, she brings a tremendous uh, wealth of experience as an owner and as an investor of, uh, of small businesses. And she's also managed and mentored and invested uh, in, in small businesses across the United States. She understands and appreciates how investments uh, can transform a region and transform the lives of, of, of people in a community especially if they combine this element of impact investing and the bottom line. So with that, I'd like to introduce Administrator Karen Mills. Karen. Well, I can't imagine life without Ginger Lou. I'm having a hard time on that, and I know many uh, across the White House feel the same. Um, because she's championed this kind of um, advance for us and also the regional clusters work um, that can be very much related to the transformation uh, of places like rural Maine, where I'm from, and uh, it has a, kind of a sister set of activities from this. So um, first of all, thank you to this great panel. Uh, I thought they were terrific, and I'm going to actually refer back to a couple of things that they brought up. Uh, particularly this notion of using some of the tools that we already have in government to advance this intense activity that it really is existing in this sector. And as some of you know, you know, I, I'm from the private sector. I grew up in the private equity world before there was private equity investing. And uh, when I looked at that J.P. Morgan report, I, I guess I've been not thinking about it, but we have really come maybe to the tipping point or over the tipping point, depending on what all you, you all decide today, this is a very important moment. And we do actually have in government a number of tools to make public-private partnerships accelerate in this area. And I, I'm going to talk about um, the things that we are actively doing uh, at the SBA to advance this agenda. But first, I'm going to back up. Um, because Cheryl talked about Startup America. How many of you know what Startup America is? Good. 
You all should know what it is because it is the administration-wide effort to help our high-growth entrepreneurs. And what we say at the SBA is there's many kinds of entrepreneurs. We help Main Street entrepreneurs, restaurant opens, restaurant closes. We're there with new loans for them. But most of the net new job creation and the innovation is taking place in this high growth sector. Startup America is a public-private partnership uh, in conjunction with Steve Case and a number of uh, corporate uh, participants. And those of us across the administration in the SBA and other places who are working with entrepreneurs. And what we said in this room when we talked about Startup America this winter is we were going to do a number of things. We said first we were going to work on um, acceleration, uh, accelerating the growth of some of these high growth businesses with mentorship. And we actually launched a nas nationwide mentor core we launched the pilot program um, with companies that have been funded by the Department of Energy. We said we were going to fund four accelerators at the SBA to match uh, 100 of these promising clean energy entrepreneurs with mentors who had been there and done that. And we've done that program. So it is now sort of poised for that next step um, uh, coming forward. And I think this notion of mentorship and counseling is equally important as the money. And the second thing um, we said is that what we were hearing from a lot of the entrepreneurs is that there were a lot of barriers to their growth. And we were going to go out and find out what they were. And we went out around the country, and I'm around the country anyway. I think I've been in 34 states. Um, and yesterday was Pittsburgh, and we talked about exactly this, that there are barriers to entrepreneurs finding the help they need from the federal government. There are barriers to entrepreneurs with regulation. How can we do what the president wants to do, which is remove those barriers? You heard Bill Daly talk about this uh, uh, frequently. The president really believes that we should and has asked Cass Sunstein to uh, do a regulatory review and get rid of unnecessary and burdensome regulation. So we went around the country, and you're going to see uh, very shortly, actually, um, the summary of that report. And you're already seeing Cass Sunstein come up with a number of the regulations that we're working on removing. The third thing, though, we said is very relevant to what we're talking about today. And that is we made a commitment at the SBA to do an impact investment initiative of $1 billion over five years. Now, we may have gone quiet about it. Who talked about being quiet? Um, uh, but I want to make sure you all know about it, because um, you're going to be hearing a lot about it uh, starting now. You saw from the uh, JP Morgan report that this kind of investing is moving, as they, they called it, from the periphery to the mainstream which I think some of you will agree with, uh, others of you might not. But we believe in this win-win formula. And so what we asked ourselves at the SBA is how could we use, as John said, the tools that we already have to give the taxpayers a good bang for their buck um, and have a model. And what we have at the SBA is something called SBICs. Who knows about SBICs? Who is an SBIC? All right, good. Well, I'm, I don't have to give quite the primer then, but we have, um, these are small business investment companies. They're licensed by us at the SBA. We um, have about 300 of them, actually. And they've got a, quite a good track record. They leverage private, they're the ultimate public-private uh, partnership, and they actually are subsidy neutral, no cost to taxpayers. So it makes them a very powerful model. We did also here in this room the Hall of Fame of SBIC folks. And I'm going to just reprise a couple. See if you can guess who this is. Back in 1969, computers and microchips were the emerging industry. Remember that? An SBIC invested $300,000 in a chip manufacturer with 200 employees and 500,000 in revenues. Today, it's Intel. Uh, in the mid-70s, air cargo industry. Another SBIC invested $5.8 in a small company. Today, it's FedEx. We had a whole list of these. I won't go through them all. But the current example, Action Carding Environmental Services. It's based in a low-income uh, 
area of New Jersey. This is a recent investment. Facilities in the Bronx and Brooklyn. We made an SBIC investment in uh, 2007. They went from 94 employees to 365, and they've built one of New York City's largest recycling facilities, 100,000 tons of waste each month. So this is how SBICs are working. And one of the complaints that I heard when I came in um, is too much paperwork, too much time. Right? It's too burdensome to do an SBIC. In fact, uh, Sean Green, who's here um, in the back, and make sure you know him, has cut the turnaround times in half. He's put a fast track program in for those who have already are coming for their second or third fund, which I think is what, two months? Two months uh, for turning around those licenses. And he's doubled the amount of financings that have gotten done. So we did 1.6 billion in financing last year through SBICs, 1.6 billion. So this is now a very effective tool of government. How are we going to turn it um, to the issue that you are all engaged in? We chose the SBIC as the platform for this billion dollar impact investment initiative. And we do it because, uh, and what we're gonna do is provide two to one match to licensed funds, and we pick two categories, place-based and sector-based. And place-based, we're targeting underserved markets. You know, we have, um, right now, as you all know, most of the venture capital investment goes in three or four states. And we have great ideas and great entrepreneurs everywhere, and particularly in underserved markets where there's a market gap and there's a shortage of this capital. Second thing, we're going to target emerging industries. And as a country, clean energy is one that we know. Um, we've got a lot of opportunity in, and that's one we're going to work on as we uh, plan to outcompete the rest of the world with our, our, our entrepreneurs and our innovators. So stay tuned. Um, we expect to announce, we're announcing our first partnership, so the fund is funded and um, getting underway. So the first Im of these impact funds we're going to announce, and we have several other fund managers and institutions. We have a call out to all of you, so hopefully some of you are in conversation with us. Please talk to Sean Green if you've got questions or are interested in understanding. There's not one deadline. This is a rolling process. So you'll be able to, you know, when you're ready, come in and apply. And we can also match make between great fund managers and those um, we have who are quite interested in providing capital. So um, please continue that conversation with us. Now, you're going to now go and try to answer some of the additional questions that we have. And we appreciate that very much because all, the, all of the uh, things that we can do here are not yet written. So once again, I know one of your roundtables is going to follow up on our Reducing Barriers road trip that we did to eight cities where we've gotten a whole series of ideas. So we want to continue to bring those forward and implement them. And I think we want to understand how to um, do the rest of what we're going to implement on this billion dollar fund and what else we can do under this umbrella. We have extensive resources, as you know, uh, around the country who counsel entrepreneurs and underserved markets in um, all sectors. And we want to be able to link, leverage, and align those things that we are doing with those things that you are doing um, and we have $90 billion in loan guarantees and capital that are also an important part of this equation. So I'll just close by saying, remember the impact of our entrepreneurs and small businesses. Half of Americans who work own or work for a small business. And they create 64% of the net new jobs. And maybe these high growth companies you're talking about create all the net new jobs, depending on which study you see. So if we are going to do what the president talks about, out-innovate, out-compete, out-build the rest of the world, it's going to be because we support our entrepreneurs and our investors to create uh, more jobs and the prosperity that we are looking forward to. So thanks for your help and thanks for being here today.
Okay, now on to the hard work. Um, we have four breakout sessions. Uh, for those of you, I think it's every, everyone's breakout sessions is on their card, plus the room number uh, is on there. So if you just look at your name tag, it will be on there. Um, for those of you that are in breakout A, you're gonna leave through this entrance to my right. And for those of you that are in breakouts B through D, you're going to leave through that entrance because the rooms are on those sides. So breakout A is room 401, breakout B is 230A, breakout C is 428, and D is 430A. And what I hope you'll get from these sessions is a real frank conversation as to what we can learn and do with policy going forward. So we'll see you at 1230.